Hi, I'm Dr. Chen Wen Liu from Adelaide, South Australia. I work at Orthopaedics 360 and I'm a hip and knee replacement specialist. Today, I'd like to go over a little bit about what a hip replacement is actually made of. Now today, I can only talk about the hip and knee replacements that I place in, but there is a vast number of different materials that they can be made of. Now the hip replacement that I perform is one that I perform using the direct anterior approach. We won't go into this very much into detail today, but it is an approach to the hip where we do not cut or detach any of the tendons or muscles to approach the hip. When we place the prosthesis, any prosthesis can actually be placed in this way. However, we choose to place one which is specifically made to be placed with the direct anterior approach. The hip replacement that I place in is one with very good results. We follow all of our hip replacements on the Australian Joint Replacement Registry, which tracks and follows every joint replacement for the hip and knee that has been placed in for over the last 20 years and enables us to track and challenge any of the prostheses that have come about as all of them, well, almost all of them should be tracked in that system. The hip replacement that I place in is one that does not generally utilize cement. So we are trying to achieve biological fixation to the implant. What that means is that the implant has been designed to have a coating around it that allows ingrowth of bone onto it. Now that particular structure is called hydroxyapatite. In essence, it's like artificial bone. It has very small pores or holes within it of approximately five microns in size. The hydroxyapatite is coated over majority of the stem and the socket, and over the first six to 12 weeks, bone grows in and onto that substance, strengthening that uh, bond between the bone and the implant. The actual metal of the implant is made of nobium, vanadium, titanium alloy. It's a very, very strong metal that I've never seen break before. When you place the metal inside the body, there is a very slight flexibility or elasticity to the metal. And that was designed to avoid having too stiff a construct, which in the past was translated to potentially causing people to have some thigh pain at the tip of the stem. Now with this particular design, there are very many different sizes, as well as different lengths and offsets. What that means is that we're trying to replicate what the native anatomy of a patient is. And we have several permutations or options that we are allowed to choose that allow us to replicate a patient's anatomy when we perform the surgery. I like to perform all of my operations using something called patient-specific technology, which is where we actually perform a three-dimensional scan on the hip before the surgery, so we know the exact dimensions, position, shape, and size long before the operation is performed. That gives me the option to alter or accept the anatomy that you have. It also allows us to select the correct prosthesis before we even come into the operating theater and to identify any anatomical abnormalities which we may need to account for. The actual articulating part constitutes the ball and the liner. The ball and the liner of a hip replacement can either be made of metal, ceramic, or plastic. In general, the ball is either metal or ceramic, and the liner is either metal, ceramic, or plastic. The options that I utilize are a ceramic ball and either a plastic or a ceramic liner. Now, ceramic on ceramic has been an articulation which has gained a lot of favor due to the fact that it is quite an inert substance. In the past, and this is a long time ago, the plastics which were first generation were certainly of not of the quality of current plastics or ceramics. This means that as the plastics used to wear out, the body used to remove those plastics and cause a white blood cell response that could get between the implant and the bone, causing quite a large amount of bone loss. This turned into quite a difficult revision scenario, some of which are still being done today, but we are seeing a decrease in those catastrophic revisions or very difficult revisions as the advent of more advanced materials have come about. In today's current materials, we are unlikely to see the same 
large revisions that we have been performing for those done many, many decades ago. As part of the implant, then there are other foreign materials placed during the surgery. That includes the suture material that we use to close the skin. Because we aren't cutting or detaching any of the tendons or muscles, we do not require to repair any of those structures at the end of the operation. The only sutures that are used during the surgery is to close the layers to prevent any potential sites of infection or tracts for infection, but also to create a closure that enables the skin to heal very, very finely. We use a series of special dressings over the wound to decrease the risk of any gaping or gapping of the wound. And our aim is to provide a wound that is extremely small and very, very thin and very, very unnoticeable in the future. As far as materials go for the rest of the hip replacement, there aren't really any other foreign materials that are placed in during the surgery. And for those patients who wonder whether they can feel the hip replacement after surgery, I would say that most of our patients feel that the hip replacement is barely perceptible, if at all, after the operation. Certainly the end result is to give you a forgotten hip. And that means you do not think about that hip doing all the activities that you want after the operation. I hope that's given you a little bit of insight into what a hip replacement is made of. There are certainly many other materials that it can be made of, and I'll detail a few of those in the description below. However, for me, this is what I commonly use, and I hope you found it useful. Thank you for uh, tuning in, and I hope to see you next time.